In a world full of anger, strife, and plagues, a constant struggle is battled out between good and evil, right and wrong. And for over seven years, the indie cast is here to try to make you forget all of that. With interviews, pop culture talk, and the best in sexual innuendo. So sit back and relax as Chad, Zach, and Luna welcome you to the IndieCast. Exclusively on the Wrestling Nerds Radio Network. Seven years ago. <laughs> long years ago. Seven years ago, my co-host Chad and I mm-hmm. both separately attended an all-women's wrestling show in Ybor City. Yep. We met there. Yeah. We became friends. Mm-hmm. And we started a podcast. Do you remember why? We, do you remember what I, the first thing I talked to you about when we? My T-shirt. You I had, had a Mega Man, Mega Powers T-shirt. You on. did an eight-bit Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage T-shirt. So, so. three hundred episodes. This is our three hundredth episode of this podcast. Seven years later, mm-hmm. and we thought it only fitting to have a guest who was the reason. You and I both went to that shine show. (laughs) We purposely both bought tickets for this person. Seven years ago. So dozens and dozens, please welcome to the show for the first time, the innovator of intergender wrestling, the first lady of hardcore, the most violent woman in professional wrestling, the wounded owl, LaFisto. Woohoo, LaFisto, welcome to the IndyCast. Thank you. That was such a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> and true story, hundred percent true. Yeah, hundred percent true. Both of us separately, and we hadn't met at the time yet. Both looked, and it was like because Shine had done six other episodes previous. Yes, yeah, I was just uh, the poster. No, I, it, it, it's in the other room. I can run and get it later. But um, it's framed, even yes, it's it's autographed and everything. But um, we both separately went. I because I, I'd seen the six other Shine Shine shows. I went, okay, well, I'll make one of those one day. And then legitimately, it was like. Well, if this was going to be on this one, hell yeah. yeah, I'm going to this show. And we and we did that when it was you and uh, Evil Evelise, so, yes. which which was a uh, a blast of a match, and we will talk a little bit about that right. later. But I, I but didn't anyway, get so, ahead of ourselves. So if it wasn't for Lefisto, there wouldn't be an indie cast. That's right. So um, so thank you. So we thank you. So. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> Lefisto, well, we we start every episode the same way. We have uh, five questions. Uh, that we ask uh, all, all of our guests that we'd like to call the lightning round. Yes, and, sir. And, and right. the reason for that is yeah. because uh, Lefisto has been uh, setting the podcast world ablaze. She's been going on a, uh, a press tour, Good. as it were. She's been uh, showing up all over the place on all kinds of wonderful podcasts. And she deserves to be. Absolutely. And a lot of those podcasts ask the same questions every time and bore her to tears. <laughs> so we're going to try to burn through these as quickly as we can. <laughs> and probably go off the rails very, very quickly. Well, and here's the thing about this one. I, and I'll, Lefisto, I'll be honest with you. Question number one is normally who trained you and when did you debut? Um, but here's the thing. You're one of the few guests we have that actually have a Wikipedia page. Very true. Uh, that break down their entire career. Um, so I'm not even going to ask you that question. I'm just going to make sure the info is correct. Mm. I'm going to check Wikipedia <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, so from the way I mean, you debuted in 1997 and you were trained by a gentleman named Eric LaRoche. Is that, is that correct? It's actually, there were four trainers at my first school in Sorrel. Eric LaRoche was one of them, Pierre Marchessault, Yves Miet, and Patrick Lewis. Okay. Amazing. Okay. So there we go. So I, I, I left two people out. So for those for those other folks, I apologize. Um, so blame Wikipedia. Blame Wikipedia. That's right. Well, no, I, I might have misread Wikipedia too. But uh, the second question that I will get you and ask you, what is your first wrestling memory? Of me going to a show or just wrestling, wrestling? Quite just wrestling in, in, in general. Now, keep in mind, again, when we ask this question to, like, infants who just got out of wrestling school a minute ago, and they're right. like, all the way back in 2013, and then Chad and I turn into dust. So, <laughs> so yeah. Well, wrestling memory. Let's remember watching. Mine is like 1986. There you go. There you go. <laughs> And it was watching Hulk Hogan with my grandma on TV on, like, Saturday morning. I think the show was called here in Canada, Maple Leaf Wrestling. Yes. That's amazing. Yep. <laughs> I, I didn't know that it was Maple Leaf Wrestling, too. That's what, <laughs> but she's right about the same time frame I am, because it was about, about 86 was uh, when I got into wrestling, too. So, um, 
Now, uh, question number three for the lightning round. What is the best episode of Behind the Music? Oh, I, <laughs> I just started to watch all of it. Like, I really liked the Megadeth one because I it was great to see Dave Mustaine's perspective on everything that happened with Metallica. I've, yeah. I, I've read his book before and I've actually met him, but it was nice to see his actual face when he was talking about it and how it affected him and that everything from that moment changed his life because it's, it's because he got kicked out that Megadeth was born and then he created all that, to me, a masterpiece because every album is so good and he gets better every year and he's so creative. So I, I really liked the Megadeth episode. Okay. Excellent choice. So um, question number four, uh, as many people probably know, and if they don't, they do now, uh, you are Canadian. What is your favorite Canadian food delicacy? It's not poutine. <laughs> oh, that, that was a trap. That was a trap that she, that she passed. That was she a trap. Trap. Actually, it's, it's a Quebec delicacy, poutine. But um, I don't know if I have a favorite like Canadian meal. Uh, I would say everything my mom cooks. My mom's a real good cook. And uh, me and my boyfriend are on this diet, and it's so hard to – because she, she always comes home like, hey, I made this for you. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> she makes, like, pies and stuff. It's like, we don't want this. <laughs> We're trying to lose weight. But, yeah, um, yeah, my mom's food is really my comfort food. Okay. Uh, now, our last question, and probably one of my favorite ones in here, and one I think that uh, we've had the last couple of weeks, we've had people that just don't have an answer. I feel like Lufisto is going to have she one better. on this one, though. Uh, Marvel oh. or DC? Here's my answer, and oh. I will thank my boyfriend for this one because he's a comic book expert. He rates comics. That's okay. what he's, he's, he had. He, he, he did that like for 15 years, and he said he describes it the best, and I think he's right. The best characters are from Marvel, but the, the, the best storylines are from DC. Okay. I like that. I can yeah. live with that. Yeah. So, I really, that's, yeah, that's really how I see it, too. Mo most, most of the guests that we ask, it's usually uh, Marvel is great, but Batman is better. Yeah, I'm like, you know there's other characters yeah. besides Batman, right? I really prefer the darkness in DC yeah. than, I, I wouldn't say Marvel is bubbly. But I mean, right. if you have the Punisher, like <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really like that DC's really dark, and the the characters are they all have like a background story where something bad happened in their lives, and they have to deal with that, and they have their own demons. I, I really like that from DC. Excellent, very nice. But well, I did have an answer. <laughs> Now, uh, Lefisto, we could go through. I was say oh, she passed the lightning round. She did, she did pass amazing. The round. Thank you, Lefisto. So, Great job. We, um, like that, uh, Zach and I both listened to a lot of the other episodes and, and shows you've been on that aren't the indie cast. That's okay. Um, but a lot of them obviously would ask you about like your history and things like that. I, I I'm more and more interested in getting a lot of opinion, your opinions on on different topics, um, sure. because you've been doing this for a, a, quite a while. You're a, a veteran. And I'm just interested to hear kind of some of your thoughts on this one. I'm going to start dark on this oh, one boy. here just because it, it just got announced today and she did put a picture up. Um, so I'm interested just to, uh, your thoughts briefly on the passing of Road Warrior Animal. Oh, that's like when you anyway, for, for me, when when I think tag team wrestling, like my first memories are, uh, you know, the Road Warriors. And there was also, you know. Uh, demolition and the heart foundation that's like from my earliest memory that's the core and and um tag team wrestling was so strong back then and they i think they're like always according to me because what happened before of course i was too young to remember but to me they were the first like bigger like they 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 were like bigger than everybody else, and not 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 just in size, but when they came out, like you could, like you believe them. They they were out there to kill, and they were like they had such a badass presence, and they were they were like cool. And um, so yeah, I've I've met Animal once, and he was so nice, and he kept laughing, and he's like. Yeah, that is, he does that with everybody when they take pictures. Like, he, he gives you his, his uh, like, set. Like, the shoulder pad, yeah. 
yeah, the elbow pads. And I was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. And then he puts it on me. And I was like, yeah. I was like, it's, it was such a cool memory. He was like, so, yeah, he was really nice. And he was taking time to sign everything with, with the people that were there. And I thought that was really nice. And, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the biggest tab team now, unfortunately, is gone. Yeah. Well, interesting that, you know, Lefisto mentioned that, like, when you think of tag teams, you, you mm -hmm. think of, of the Road Warriors. Um, and for as much as, like, we're all, you know, we're so smart and, right. you know, wrestling is a performance art and right. da, da 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 I actually, you know, reading through the social media posts and about a lot of people, um, you know, giving their condolences and their mm -hmm. thoughts, I saw Demolition Smash posted that, like, Oh, this is heartbreaking, and right. like he was such a good friend, and I audibly gasped when I right. read that because I was like, oh, "Demolition!" But you hate the Road Warriors, like right. even as as far like they were so snooty and smart. Now, still in my brain, I'm like, right. "Oh, but they feud forever, like they right. hate each other for real." Yeah, they, they made it look. Moment. They made it look like it was like the real thing. You would watch them, and you would really hate them, and or really love the other ones. Like you really felt. Um, you know, wrestling is about creating emotions and they did a perfect job where you're like, oh yeah, like you were invested because it looked real. It didn't look scripted. It was like, uh, it looked like a shoot. So um, yeah, that, that's, that's one thing I love about wrestling when you're like, it looks so real that even if you know, it's like you get into the magic. And I think they created that. 100% correct. Like, like I said, they just perpetually live in a forever 1984 in my brain. It's <laughs> right. like, that's all real. Yeah. And that's a hundred percent. And, and I, I agree. Even when people who are jaded or, or people who are cynical now, when they get sucked up into something, yeah. that's really magical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, speaking of takes and things along those lines, one thing that you've talked about on many, many shows, being an innovator of uh, intergender wrestling is that typically hosts ask you a thousand questions about, intergender wrestling i mean you fought for intergender wrestling literally like in court and the whole nine yards to make in it happen court. Yes, in court. Uh, but instead of the approach of like well there are people who don't like it how do you defend it instead i want to look at it in more of an optimistic point of view because that would also be preaching to the choir because right. we're definitely pro yeah the, the, wrestling. yeah <laughs> um, as much as we just want to shake our heads and go good job yeah. like let's let's try to be a little deeper um if Let's say we had a fan or somebody who had never experienced intergender wrestling before. What are some examples or maybe some directions that come to your mind if you were going to show somebody intergender wrestling to show, like, this is as great as it can be or this is why it's so great? Um, what, um, are some, what are some examples? First, I think I would I would try to see, like, do you like superhero movies? Because you you say you're not into men fighting women. And then, of course, if the answer is yes, well... What do you think about Black Widow? What do you think about Catwoman? What do you think about Wonder Woman? Does that bother you? And they're like, no, they're movies. Okay, but you know that these actors and stunt women are also athletes and they do, you know, the, the stunts and everything. So I would try to explain them first. Well, when it comes to wrestling, uh, not only we're kind of doing the same thing, but uh, we're playing the character on top of it. And we don't have take one, take two. It has to be perfect. So there's a level of difficulty when you are actually in the ring. So the way you have to see it is the same way you're going to watch Batman fight Catwoman. Um, you got two athletes that they do want to be there because I know a lot of people are going, this promotes domestic violence. No, this promotes equality. There's a big difference because somebody who's a, who's a victim of domestic violence uh, doesn't want this to happen. It's, it's not supposed to happen. But as an athlete, um, you choose to be there. You're trained to be there. You want to be seen as an equal. You want to fight everybody. You want to have the best matches possible. And sometimes the best matches uh, can be against a guy. Um, I had great matches against women, and I had also like great matches against guys. One of my favorite from last year is fighting Josh Alexander. Um, so I, there's there's a lot of girls who go out there and do great intergender wrestling. Kimberly's one of them. Um, I, I haven't seen much of her work in terms of intergender because I, I have been working a lot during the pandemic stuff, but I heard Kylie Ray's doing it great, and she had great matches with Ethan Page. Uh, and 
Uh, and, you know, Jessica Hav is a legit badass, so she can go out there and have great matches against the guys. Uh, of course, a name that always comes when, when, when you're talking intergender wrestling, you had Tessa, who was the Impact champion. So, um, you know, there, there's a good way to do it, and um, you're, you're either for it or against it, but, you, I mean... You, you, not for it or against it. You like it or you don't. I, I always compare intergender wrestling and, and hardcore wrestling. Uh, it's not for everybody, but people who love it are really passionate about it. But you have you have to kind of clear your mind and look at it at two athletes. And if you look into those names, uh, like the Kimberleys, the Jessica Havoc, the, I, I know I'm forgetting people, like Mickey Knuckles, you know, legit badass too that can go out there fight the guys <laughs> in the street that she wants to because you know she 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 has that look she has that that you know the, when, when she comes out like she she looks like a badass and um yeah these these are probably the first names that come to mind it's like if you want to watch her gender and watch lefisto she's pretty awesome too <laughs> there you go that's what we were waiting on yes <laughs> so, uh actually you know and kind of i'm gonna kind of segue ahead, down to ahead. here um because you you know actually people had a problem with intergender wrestling i think you defended that well people also just got upset recently speaking of lufisto and how awesome she is um for some reason people started to get upset about your burning camera recently uh which yeah. you've been doing forever um and it's been like a, obviously the the main finisher of your arsenal what were your thoughts on people suddenly like you put up a few examples of you hitting people with it and People got upset, and I don't know why. What were your thoughts on people suddenly getting upset over that after it, all these years? It's been it's been like a few, like over a few weeks. People were like starting putting on clips of me giving it to Solo Darling and then Cherry Bomb, and I would always get that comments like, "Oh, you careless bitch!" <laughs> like you're proud of this, and in my head, I'm like. Yeah, the person didn't wasn't hurt. It looked right. great, <laughs> and she's still wrestling today. She's fine. But that that one day where I got like really pissed off is there's a guy who went, it's like, how about I break your neck too and you die? And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, wait a second, like wishing death upon me for a, a move. And um, speaking of Josh Alexander, he had the best reply. He's like, oh, Lufisto, you can't have, you can't do wrestling and make it look real. <laughs> like something like that. I can't, I can't remember exactly what he said. It's like, shame on you for making something look real. <laughs> and it's like, I'm like, yeah, I guess like, you can't. And that's, that's one thing. I've been doing the Burning Hammer since I, I want to say 2006, 2007. Never hurt anyone. Uh, I modify it so I don't drive the person's head. It's pretty much your own bump. You don't fall from very high, too. I'm like five months. <laughs> <laughs> and most of it, like, it, it, it goes on my hip. So I'm the one who gets problems from my hip. Because right. I, when I do the burning hammer too often, I have to go back and get adjusted. <laughs> so I get a lot of it in. And, you know... I wouldn't do it to someone that I feel I wouldn't control it. And yeah, so when, when I, somebody like were kind of giving me death threats about it, I'm like, wow, okay, that's too much. I'm like, these girls that you're seeing are all still wrestling, right. doing well. I'm like, yeah. so I was like, wow, that, that, that's the cost. Signing autographs after the show, right. it was like, okay. <laughs> exactly. so I, my defense would be like, well, there's not active warrants out for my arrest right. for just <laughs> murdering people in the ring with this, right. so I think it's okay. I think we'll be fine. <laughs> that would be a good excuse, too. <laughs> so, the one thing that, that I did want to mention as well, again, we did, we're going to call it research and not stalking social media. <laughs> um, um, one of the things that, that recently you had discussed on, on Twitter is um i don't know where it even came from but i guess somebody had from behind the keyboard had mentioned that like answering too many questions of fans or spending too much time with fans was like a bad thing that, that was it made you uh, mark as well that was um uh, uh, mike um it, oh, yeah it was mike bennett posting a yeah. thing about yes. you know 
answer your fans. They're there for you. They're your bread and butter. They, and I thought that was so accurate because I've always seen my fan as that, and I always took the time to answer every email on, unless they were like that threats. Or, well, that, is, or, that is my point. Is is you you've mentioned before that like you've even experienced like the darker side of that that right. you've had people sending you like gross stuff that you didn't want to see and death threats. And um, I think uh, you and AK had even said online that like you've had fans find your home address and mail yep. you stuff like things that are like super crossing the line that it's like, this is not okay in any stretch. And even with that, you're still like waving the flag of like, ah, but fans, man, you got, you can't, you can't turn them down. So talk a little bit about that in terms of like, how do you stay positive about interacting with fans and about, you know, that element of wrestling with some of the weird, awful stuff that you've had to endure. When some fans are jerk-offs. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I mean, you know, we've seen it firsthand, you yeah. know, going to, like, all-women shows or shows yeah. where there's a lot of female wrestlers. It's mm -hmm. like, they're not always the same fan interactions. It's right. not like, hey, you had a great match, you know, I'd love to buy a t-shirt. Sometimes it's like, yes, I know I'm sweating a lot, but can you sign this t-shirt and can I smell your hair while you're doing it? Right. It's like there, there was an element that's a little bit different. So right. how do you stay positive when you've had to deal with some ugliness? Uh, the, the fact that I get a lot more uh, good emails and good messages helps a lot. Uh, I've always said that the fans are the fuel to my career because I've been, uh, I, I thought about quitting many times. I almost did last year. <laughs> And but I always get that message and I should say messages. I do. I do get a lot of stuff like one that comes to mind is a, a father that sent me a message a few weeks ago saying, you're such a good example for my daughters because you stand up for what you believe is right. You always try to do it in a professional way. And it, it's like I, I have no shame of showing everything you did in the ring. And, and and to me, like I want my daughters to see that women can be strong, and like you get that email like that, and um, so this is this is one example. But I, I get other stuff where uh, you inspired me to be a wrestler, and so you. Unfortunately, I'm always more focused about the negatives because. When I, when I did the CW, when I called them out on the way they were branding us, I got so many uh, death threats, people calling me an hypocrite, call it, like mixing up all kinds of stuff. Um, oh, you did some sexy pictures. Why the hell they can't promote you as a porn star? I'm like, sexy pictures and promoting my work as a wrestler is definitely not the same thing. Right. And what I choose to do and what I tell them they can do with my image is definitely not the same thing either. So people were like, crossing all kinds of stuff. People were like, you're ungrateful to CCW. They made you. And I'm like, I've always, I always mentioned them as where I was born. And I mean, I always say John Zandig is the one that made me. And I've always seen him as a father figure because he believed in me when I did not. And he pushed my limits and he believed that I could do everything, uh, you know, po like possible. It's like, oh, you can do it, kid. He would call me kid. You can do it, kid. You can do it, kid. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. I know you can do it. it. That's the relationship I have with John. So I'm forever grateful to him. And people would mix up the new CCW with the older one. But I come from the John Zandig CCW. And um, so, yeah, you just try to keep, you know, the, the, the good and try to remove the bad. But there was one guy who was harassing me night and day for... It lasted about two weeks until I got legal help to try to find him and get rid of him because it was like it, it was so bad um, trying to create like he was creating fake news and stuff like uh, the funniest one. He, he said something like, oh, she did coke with coke with Scott the Moore. I'm like. Okay, I've never did coke in my life, and then unfortunately, I've never met Scott the Moore. We're both oh, Canadian, oh. but it never happened. Yeah. So I was like, "Where the hell does this guy?" And it kept going, and you know, stories like that, nonstop, night and day, and and on every social media I have, he would comment on every match I have on my YouTube, uh, my my Twitter, my Facebook. 
I did an interview live on, on Instagram and he was trying to take over the question. It was like completely nuts. And I almost lost my mind there. And I was like, why would somebody do that? I mean, I, I understand with the pandemic, people are bored, but it was like way too much. But at least I had so many fans and even wrestlers standing up and, you know, defending me. And so I'm really trying to be mature and peaceful about all this and to kind of, okay, I'm going to keep the gun. And if you're banned, um, I always say now, <laughs> I'm too old for this shit. So I'm like, <laughs> try to remove that from my life, everything that's negative. Um, I had one cancer and I will do everything I can not to be so stressed that I get another one. So it's like very important for me to try to eliminate everything that's negative. Focus on the positive. Okay. And not always an easy thing to do. So no. good. Uh, no, it's not. It's no. not. <laughs> Excellent on you for for doing that. Well, here let me let me change subjects in a little bit, and okay. we'll try to we'll try to go positive. I think that's a good way <laughs> to turn on this one here. Uh, wh who is the best metal band ever? And then kind of a to, you know b to that question. What's the best live concert you've ever seen? Um, my my favorite band is will always be I think Iron Maiden. Live concert I've seen. Uh, of course, Maiden was great. Guns and Roses that I saw. Uh, was it three years ago? I was so surprised. Like, I was not expecting that. I'm like, eh, you know, I don't know how Axel's voice is. And I, I know if, you know, um, so it's like, I, 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 we get there and we, we were, we, it was in Philadelphia. So we had tickets to go see the Eagles. And I turn around and right next, like, to the Wells Fargo Center, tonight, Guns N' Roses. I'm like, <laughs> really <laughs> and we got some tickets on the fly they messed up our tickets so they gave us like family tickets we ended up on the players uh like wow. bench so it was like yes. wow awesome and um <laughs> the show starts and there's no uh there's no band before them and they play and i'm like my favorite uh guns and roses song is you could be mine and i'm like it's too tough to sing now he won't do it. Then, of course, I hear the first notes. I'm like, no. And then he starts. I'm like, oh, my God. I was like, my mouth, like, was open the whole song. I could not believe it on point. And they played for four hours <laughs> nonstop. So I'm like, wow. I, I've never thought I would see Guns N' Roses like this. But they put on a hell of a show. And the last show I, I saw before the pandemic, which made me fall in love with him even more, is King Diamond. I saw him in a smaller venue in Montreal. And I, I knew about him. I liked his music. But, like, I was not I, – I was a fan. But when I saw him live, I totally fell in love with him. And now I can't get enough of him. <laughs> it's like he's so – like like I said, it was a smaller venue, but it looked – big like the stage like looked like an asylum and he had like a, a a weird zombie dancer and somebody playing grandma from his song and everything was so like theatrical and it's like oh so good so yeah definitely those excellent, excellent. now uh for concerts are you more of a do you do you ever get into the pit or are you more of a uh for okay. Antrax, I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My God, and I'm wearing an Antrax t-shirt tonight. Um, we uh, we have a thing in Montreal called Heavy Montreal, which is a big like metal. Uh, it's not a convention; it's like a, like tons of concert in over two days, nonstop. And uh, my my boyfriend's a big metalhead too, so we went there last year. And when Antrax started playing, like I felt like I was like 14 years old again, and I jumped <laughs> in the pit. <laughs> I did the Wall of Death, the War Dance. Yeah, that was that's awesome. <laughs> I was having so much fun. Uh, and when they played the uh, Got the Time, I lost my shit. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, I do get in the pit, but it, it has to be for someone I really, really like. So Antrax. 
There, and it's a friendly pit, too. You fall down, somebody's right there to pick you up. You're okay, they dust you off, and then, whoa, you get pushed again. Like, it's a friendly pit, so it's fun. <laughs> I was going to say, there was, like, a half a dozen, like, metal guys in Montreal who have no idea that they got clotheslined by one of, like, the, the greatest right. wrestlers in <laughs> independent history. Okay. And they're like, oh, this is little blonde woman was there. She said to have a good yeah. time, and she knocked the shit out of me at one point. Yeah. Uh, I think I heard someone yell burning hammer at some point. I don't know what that means, but I got well, thrown head over ass like that. Somebody, like, pushed me real hard during Slayer, and I really, like, was so pissed. I swing, and I gave him a forearm behind the head, and he fell. There you go. <laughs> but, yeah, I no, did hit the In the corner, they don't know what's going on. Um, amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> I actually, I, I went one year to the uh, to the gathering of the Juggalos, and uh, there is a group there that did the, the Wall of Death thing. I am not a pit person by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, my I believe fiance at the time, now wife, um, had to stop me from bashing somebody's head in with a, with a flashlight because because I got stuck in the middle of it. I, oh, of course. It's like I saw the crowd split. And I'm like, what's going on? And then it was like, you fucker. And I was like, and Shelly had to be like, no. The, 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 I, the sea parted. Yeah. I went to the gathering once because I was wrestling. It was ma wrestling Mary Dobson. Amazing. And I have a funny story. I Wait. never So I'm walking around. Uh, I think it's before the show because the show was late. And I'm walking around wearing a tank top. And then there's that lady. She comes and grabs my arm. She's like, oh, my God, you have fabulous tits. Can I do a line of coke on them? I'm like, what the hell is happening? Yeah. I was like, what? Lo and behold, like, that's actually on a Hallmark card now. Yeah. Sorry, there's that. <laughs> I was like, I'm done with this match. I'm leaving. <laughs> Oh, I, I, there you could have made that part of your entrance, and it would have been, you know. Amy too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then that's just a business deal. Then you turned right. Down. That's oh just, my god, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, what year, that's what year did you do the? Did you go to? Did you perform at the gathering? Do you remember what year that was? Two thousand and I want to say fourteen. I think so. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, darn. I couldn't remember if that was one of the years I went. Sadly, so not. um. One of the things that you've mentioned previously is that, like, and, and I completely agree that you have the pedigree at this point to, you could absolutely be a fantastic teacher, and that any company that brings you in to wrestle men or women who are maybe earlier in their careers, that's like, it's like having a, you're going to have a great match, and also there might be a TED Talk there. Like, it's just, <laughs> a, it's a beautiful winning combination. And I know for a fact that you, um, unlike some wrestlers, you've had a really deep hand in your own merchandise, designing your own merchandise. You are a graphic designer, <clears throat> tangibly making your own merchandise. And so something that we always kind of champion younger wrestlers is to try to get into merchandising yourself as early as possible. But mm -hmm. if you can, would you mind throwing out any other tips or ideas for maybe younger wrestlers who are listening when it comes to merchandising? I mean, the first thing, the first thing I would do is that I know uh, t-shirts can get expensive but there's little things like buttons and pictures. Like these are the few things you could, or stickers sometimes can be really cheap to get. So if you're starting, you don't have much money. That's like, it's in, it's so easy to get, you know, grab a few pictures. And like I, I take pictures with my phone. It's good enough. You print them and you can make like five to 10 bucks by pictures. And they only cost, it costs less than a box at a staple or whatever, uh, wherever you are. And yeah, definitely as soon as you can get into that merchandise because it's especially when you're starting and you're not making money, it's gonna help you with the gas, it's gonna help you with your food. Um, so merchandise is such a big thing and it, it brands, it gives you a brand because um, you, you have to um, you have to promote yourself if you're a product. So you have and uh, first you know if you think of Danhausen or Warhorse, they're so good at that like. They're not only like good wrestlers, but they their stuff looks cool. So you want to wear their stuff. You want to, you know, have the, the, the war horse pins on your jacket or, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, start small if you have to, but do something so you create that brand 
and then had a had a t-shirt later had a hey now face masks are the thing now yeah. there's so many things you can do uh and i like t-shirts are really expensive especially when you're starting but pictures buttons there's a way to get around and you know get your name out there because it's always cool when you go at a show and you see somebody coming it's like oh they're wearing my t-shirts and, oh they have a pin of me they they and they come like can you sign this picture so it's always cool and actually i don't know if you saw speaking of kind of we mentioned iron maiden earlier i don't know if you saw the most recent warhouse warhouse insurance yeah, uh, doing the uh oh, what album cover was it now too oh, it was, it was, it was a, um, beast um number of the beast yes number of the beast yeah yeah so but yeah it was a cool cool shirt design from them so um, well, and I want to just kind of to round out the merchandising thing, you know, you had such a fantastic, I, I'd say brand for the longest time when you were, you know, basically like the, the embodiment of wrestling anime, and then you became <laughs> the wounded owl, like you've come to wrestling with such a direction in terms of, you know, how you wanted to be presented. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because I, we're in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a bajillion wrestlers down here. Right. And, and 60 different coaches. And there's a bajillion more every day. And a lot of them don't really rely on, or they don't really push having a character. They more focus just like, oh, I'm just going to go out there and I'm just going to wrestle. And that'll kind of carry me on. And I, I sometimes disagree with that. So what are your thoughts being someone who has had such control over their brand and has had such a focus as a character that you've changed and reinvented? <clears throat> How does that, how would you explain that kind of concept to someone who's new to wrestling? The thing is, there's so many people who can go out there and say, oh, I just want to be a badass. But there's like 20,000 badasses. Do you want to stand out? Do you want people to remember you? Even if they can't remember your name or something, they will remember you because you stand out and you're different. I was talking about Dan Alzen. You know, he has his face paint and his mannerism. It's like, hey, don't swear. So, you know... I, yeah, even sometime when I swear too much, my boyfriend's gonna go, "Don't swear, don't swear." Like it's, it's such a it's a Danhausen thing, but it became like you know something bigger. Um, so yeah, every, everybody can go out there and look tough and look like Stone Cold Steve Austin, but you know when there's somebody who stands out, like why the Undertaker has been such a a big influence and you know has been a main character for so many years. Because he was not like anyone else. He he had this aura. He, and he was reinventing himself every single time. From the ministry to the badass to back to the taker. And uh, Chris Jericho is someone else. Chris Jericho is a great example of, you know, the lion heart. More of a, you know, cool baby face. And then he went the heel with little... Um, uh, not a ponytail, but like a okay, weird top knot. The, uh, the Pebbles uh, Flintstone. The Pebbles Flintstone, yeah. That's exactly. And then he, like, it was the conspiracy theory thing. And then he became the man of a thousand and four holes. <laughs> and yes. then, uh, you know, went to Y2J. And then there was the list. And there was like the scarf. Like every single time he reinvents himself so you're never bored by him there's he always brings something new he changed it, it's his brand it's chris jericho but he you know moves stuffs around changes things brings something new and he always tries something new so it's it's really like that if you if you especially if you're aiming for longevity in this business you have to there's always an evolution. There's an evolution in the ring. You should always be learning in every match you do. But there's also an evolution in your character, in the way uh, the way you talk, the way you present yourself. Um, it, gear. Gear is so important. Uh, I remember I was so obsessed that every Shimmer show I had, I needed new gear for all my matches because I didn't want people to see me when they were watching the DVDs wearing the same thing. It was the same thing for Shine Wrestling when I was a champion. I would not wear the same gear at every defense. I would change gear, make sure every single show I had something different. So, so you know, you look unique. You look like you're always bringing something new. And it's, yeah, keep, you know, keep yourself unique by reinventing everything and making everything better and learning from every every match and every character and get that evolution going you're, you're, you'll stay in this business for a long time excellent very nice 
Uh, now, speaking briefly on evolution, I'm going to go back a little. Well, we're going to go back a little bit twice here. Oh, boy. Uh, well, one, because I have one question um, that, that I have to ask, um, because uh, I miss her some days. Okay. Uh, do you miss Pegaboo sometimes? <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Um, it, it's, I mean, Pegaboo was such, it, it was unexpected. It was supposed to last one show, and. She got so over, I had to keep her. <laughs> and I still have her. I still have her. They're actually in a, uh, you know, those living dead girls dolls. They're oh, like, in yeah. coffins. like I have a coffin and she's in. The- <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's okay. I, that, amazing. Made, that made me happy okay. to put the question in now, just knowing that. So, <laughs> so one thing with Peggy Boy, I do have the original. But when I started the character, I it was a um, it was a, a a store called Zellers. It doesn't exist anymore. It was like the older Walmart of Canada. Okay. So I bought, so I bought that old that doll, like cheap doll, and I bought two just in case I would break the first one. And I still have the other one too in the package. Oh, just in okay. case. That's a collector's yeah, I still there. have them both. And I there's a lot of people who ask me, it's like, hey, you sell gear for collectors. Can you sell Pegaboo? I'm like, mm, no. <laughs> I want to keep her. Good. I Good. all my gear. But Pegaboo, I'm like, I'm, I'm keeping her. I was say, anything can happen in wrestling. There could be a reunion someday. That's right. The, 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 the last, you know, the last hurrah Pegaboo makes a reappearance. No, I'll, or, it's, or it's, it's Savage Elizabeth all over again. She puts <laughs> Pegaboo up on her shoulder. Everyone cries. I'll be, I, I, I will be in tears at the end. I'll get me? choked up. I'll get I choked would, up. I wouldn't be okay with that. So, uh, okay, so, uh, Lefisa, one of the things that, that got you to come on the show was actually talking a little bit about uh, the stories that you have. Um, that you hopefully one day will tr- become. Uh, I'll say she's look- actively working on a book. The book, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we picked out just a few matches. Um, I think I have four here that are from your past, and I'm just interested if you have any road stories on these. These are probably like some of the highlights. Uh, hopefully, I don't destroy too much of the book here with the ones I picked yeah, out. Yeah, wait, wait but, a spoiler, like everything. Well, like, yeah. By the way, I wrestled him too. <laughs> a spoiler alert. So, um, but uh, the first one I want to bring up is probably a big one here: um, winning the CZW Iron Man title. Uh, facing off against Kevin Steen. Um, any re- you know, remember to the stories, anything from that match that you might remember? Uh, that night, I actually, uh, at first, I had a match with Larry Sweeney. Uh, God bless him. And um, well, large. So, we, so <laughs> there's a yeah, there's a story about Larry Sweeney. I don't think I ever told. Um, before the show, Maven comes to me, which is the right hand man of Zandig. He's like. I think Sweeney's scared of you. I'm like, why? I don't want to. Like, he's so good. I don't want to hurt him. He's like, he thinks you hit for real. I'm like, no. He's like, just tell him you need you need to go out there and hit as hard as you want. And I'm like, okay. Like, I, I wanted to listen to what the boss says. So I tell Sweeney. I didn't know how to tell him that. I was so embarrassed. But I, I thought the joke was kind of funny. So he's like, oh, we're not going to hit each other too hard, right? I'm like, oh, yes, we will. Like like in Japan, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And we went in there, and we had a good match. But I, I think, yeah, they told me he, he didn't want uh, – he was scared or something. I can't remember exactly what they told me. But I was like, they wanted me to pretend that I was going to. And I was like, oh. And I felt so bad about it. I'm like, why did I do that? Um, but no, I had a good experience with with um, with um, Larry. And after they, um, it happened twice actually at CCW that I show up on one match I ended up in two. <laughs> so there was that trap um, main event thing where it's like a big cage around and yeah. it's gonna be teams. And um, I thought he was joking when he said I would be in there too with the Canadians, but then I quickly realized that I was in the match. <laughs> Thank God I brought two gear. Um, and long story short, during the day, um, the the plan was to remove the belt from Kevin, but first the first um, idea was to give it to Generico. Because the thing is, Kevin was, like, pissing off everybody, so there would be a gimmick where um, 
Zendig would tell him, hey, whoever pins you, I don't care who from what team, whoever pins you, you're losing your belt tonight. And with three other teams, uh, blackouts, well, it was we were three in total, blackout, the forefathers, and us. And um, so the generic was like, no, I'm, I have other plans. I'm not coming back to CCW, at least for a while. I, I didn't know exactly uh, what was the plan for him. And then Kevin, as a joke, looks at me, looks at Zending's like, what about her? And that's when Zending's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a joke, but he's like, I don't know if he saw money signs or I don't know what happened. And, but in his brain, he was like, oh, yeah. And then, hey, kid, what are you gonna, we're going to give you the belt. I'm like, huh? <laughs> it, was, it was such a surprise. And to me, it, it like despite the storyline, it made no sense to cover my own partner. But it's like, yeah, we're going to do a gimmick where in your match with, with Sweeney, he's going to be very disrespectful and he's going to cut a promo. Then I'm going to come out and tell him that whoever pins him, whatever, whatever. So it made no sense, but it worked because when I pinned him, there was such a big pop. I was looking at clips yesterday because I'm working on the video to try to kind of trying to put together like a retrospective of everything. So I started watching some old stuff and I was like, oh, I forgot there was such a great reaction. But yeah, it all started from a joke. <laughs> that that worked. But if you, uh, you can. When it comes to stories, there is a certain amount of magic to things just coming out of nowhere. Right. Like when you're watching <laughs> Star Wars the first time and Darth is I am your father. It comes out of nowhere. Right. We know it now, but at the time, everyone was like, Duh, what? Right. So sometimes <laughs> that kind of out of nowhere element can yeah. elicit the kind of reaction that you want. You yeah. can't overuse it, but I, I feel like, uh, you know, LeFisto beating Steen for the title is the Darth Vader uh, revealing <laughs> that his father of pro yeah. wrestling. I'll take that. <laughs> We're available to write the foreword in your book if you need. That's anyway. Right. Uh, uh, Next match uh, that we wanted to see if you had any stories on, uh, 2007 IWA Mid-South Queen of Death match, uh, winning the title against one Mickey Knuckles. Uh, any any remember? And quite as this Queen of Death match, you may not remember much of it, quite honestly. True. Just well, I do, actually. I do. Um, uh, I, I especially, my, my match with Mickey is one of my favorite death matches ever. Uh, and, but I especially remember the two matches before that. Um, the first one it was Roxy Cotton, myself, and VP Waltz, who was not a trained wrestler. Oh and boy. Oh my god, was it like. <laughs> we tried real hard, <laughs> and she had no clue. And then at least I did some good spots with, with, with uh, Roxy. And during this match, at one point, I get thrown in the in the ropes, the barbed wire ropes. Then I'm like, oops, what's going on? I'm stuck. My arm, I can't, I can't get it out. But I have like a spot coming, so I'm like, well, I have no choice. Oh. So I ended up with a gash, like, oh god, it's it's like. Uh, four inches on my bicep and that's why I have like uh, a bar, not, it's not really a bar bar, it's more of a tribal that goes around my arm. Before I had the tattoo sleeve, I just had like the bracelet and it was to cover that nasty scar. There was a purpose to that bracelet. <laughs> so that's match number one and I did the finish on Roxy that went okay. Then after I, I wrestled a lady by the name of Storage, which was the Four Corners of Pain, so everything was going fine. We even had a like bump pin. And at one point, I'm like, there was like a, one of the corners of pain was like, uh, was like a, a piece of one, and they would put stuff in it. One had mouse straps, the other one had plates, or the other one had thumbtacks. And there was one with salt and uh, lemons. So I'm like, what the hell? Like, I didn't get it. What a stupid idiot. So I, I hit Storm with it, and I think, like, oh, it's going to be funny. I'm going to grab the lemons and put her, like, in her eyes. 
but then I grab the lemons and when I start squeezing, I, I'm all cut on the ends from the previous match and this one. And then like it starts burning and I'm like, ah, oh! <laughs> I'm like in pain from those lemons. I'm like, oh God, that was the idea of the lemons. And I felt so stupid, but I was like, oh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After that, it was the match with Mickey, and I, I had been looking forward to this for a long time because a lot of people were telling me we need to see Mickey now go for Soul Fisto because right, we were pretty much the only two girls who were doing hardcore. Um, like some of them, like the other girls, they were doing it once in a while, but me and Mickey were really like dead mass wrestlers. So when that happened, and we had such good chemistry, I always say Mickey's my bloody sister from another mister. And yeah, it's it's still today one of my favorite death matches. That's amazing. Uh, last match we're going to ask about today um, is uh, one that we talked about at the beginning of the episode, but I think it's a good way to bookmark it. Uh, Shine 7, your debut against Evil East, the one that started this podcast, as we said. Uh, what memories do you have of debuting for Shine? Uh, I, it's, it's one of the matches that I had. And then I, I did like three shows for Shine here and there, but I was not a regular. So that was the first one ever. Um, and I, I've never met Evil East before. And uh, when I got there, like we had like, her lucha style was fitting really well with my more of a strong style, a technical slash. I do everything else besides lucha, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm really, I'm good at catching and everything. So uh, no, we had really good chemistry, and it just flew like so naturally between me and her. And if I remember cor correctly, that was uh, the shine match of the year for uh, this this year. The, so, yeah, the, the sad part is we had such a great match. It was match of the year, and they didn't bring me back for I don't know how many shows. And then I did the tournament for the the shining title that was won by Rain. Um, I was in a four way with Mercedes, Su Young, and I can't I think Nikki Rocks. I'm not sure, but I think it was Nikki Rocks. And then I went to second round where I lost to Rain. Uh, but after that, I only came back number 29 against Jessica Havoc. And then we have to fast forward to 37 when I actually come in, fight Evil Lisa again. And then I turn and then I'm there for um, until like, like all the, the right. yeah. Um No, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Like I said, I remember being there. I remember losing my shit. Yep. And, uh, yeah, that match absolutely was match of the year. Yeah, it was. Um, so we've got a few questions here that we have to ask everyone. Yep. Uh, slightly different tone than the lightning round, yeah. I like to think. <laughs> so uh, you've obviously traveled literally all over in, in the, the sport of professional wrestling. By the way, it's very interesting we get to this question after asking about Shine, because yes. this is the Trevin this Adams works. Memorial question, question. Uh, even though Trevin's not dead. Hi, Trev. Um, uh, so... You're, well, you asked this question. What am oh, I doing stealing your stuff? You could have taken it. I, I don't mind. That's okay. So uh, it's late at night. Uh, you obviously have done the drives for many years. Uh, you are hungry. You need something to eat. Uh, you don't want to stop at McDonald's or something, or maybe it's at the time frame when not everything was open 24 hours. Um, but you're coming over a hill and a shining beacon suddenly opens up. Is that shining beacon that you're seeing for uh, delicious food a sheet or is it a Wawa? You know what? I'm going to say sheets because I've been so sick at Wawa once. For those who've seen the match versus Athena, the two out of three, I am completely like I was such an like on autopilot during this match. And it's like a match that lasts 40 minutes. Oh. <laughs> I, ate, I ate a Wawa sandwich in the afternoon and food poisoning like there's no tomorrow. And I can't, I, I, I don't even know how I got through this match. Like I would, <laughs> again, like I said, I was watching some of the old matches in the past few days. And I'm there, but I'm not really there. <laughs> you kind of see it in my eyes. And that's because of that damn sandwich. And after I win the championship, that's the day I win the championship. Oh, too. Oh. Celebrate. 
And as soon as I crossed the curtain, I fell to the floor. And Angie Sky from Quebec was there. She helps me <laughs> to get in the shower. And I stayed there for 45 minutes shivering. Oh my God. And I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> It was like so terrible. I was there butt naked and she was like sitting nearby just to make sure I wouldn't fall on my ass. And I was even sitting on a chair in the shower. It was such a bad memory. So yeah. Thing, I'll though, take sweets. <laughs> if there was the the food poisoning, <clears throat> sitting in a chair water running down, holding the title, that's a fucking metal album cover. <laughs> that, that's, true. That's, that's, what, that's what you do. You know uh, what? Yeah. It was on the, the other chair right next to the shower. What there a great picture it's been. <laughs> the title has a bath towel on it. It's well, weird. Anyway. Wawa tried to, <laughs> your Wawa tried to kill the fist though. But she still was at her best. That's, well, that's my true. point. <laughs> she was still at her best. What a story it made. That's All the right. positive spin I'm going to throw go. on it. Um, well, Zachary, so, yes. go, yeah, go into your go into the final two. Yes. So it's been uh, it's been a little time since uh, we got real sad. So let's go ahead and bring <laughs> bring down the tone of the show let's again. Darken it up again. <laughs> yeah. So unfortunately, in the incredible performance art that we all know and love of professional wrestling, we lose a lot of talent early. And so, with that being said, Lufisto, um, what is who is a uh, a a figure of professional wrestling? That is no longer alive that you would have loved to have worked with. Oh. Hmm. I I've always loved Owen Hart. Owen Hart was so good at everything he did. Like everything was perfect. He was such a great heel. Um, I would have loved to wrestle. Owen. Uh, besides him, if if we go on women's side. Uh, Sherry Martell of Luna Vachon, my God. Like, I think very underrated superstar that brought a lot to women wrestling, and I don't think they get the credit for it. Um, Luna, like, she, when they needed Sable to look like a superstar, she was right there, and she made her look like a million bucks, a true professional. She was a great manager and also a wrestler. Um, and Sherry Martell, I met her once. And she was so nice. I would have loved to work Sherry Martell. Excellent choices. Yeah, all good Excellent answers. choices. Uh, now, as uh, in addition to being in, I would say, the Mount Rushmore of uh, independent wrestling, um, being part of a band at one point, um, just being an overall amazing uh, pop culture figure. Also, proud mother of four felines. Yes. So, with that being said... <laughs> oh. The follow-up question here. We here at the IndyCast believe that every animal in nature is given certain evolutionary traits to ensure their survival. Uh, giraffes have long necks, rhinos have <laughs> big horns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our belief is that human beings, as an animal, their evolutionary trait is their ability to use tools. So with that being said, Wounded Owl Lefisto, if you could fight any animal, what would it be and what weapon would you use? I don't want to kill animals. <laughs> now, keep in mind, there are some caveats here because we've run into this issue before. Yeah, many times, actually. Bugs, snakes, creepy crawlies absolutely count. Mythical creatures also count. Right. Oh, you know what? It, it's hard for me to kill a bug. <laughs> I put them outside. <laughs> so I, literally, I, yeah. I literally yeah. own a DVD that's like, the best of Lefisto Hardcore Wrestling Volume 7 that I bought off her website. And it's like skull and crossbones and bloody mm -hmm. massacres. Yes. And we just heard, you know, it would be hard for me to kill a bug. Yeah. That's just Death just to show you the range that we're working in. Death Mask no, Goddess will sorry, but there's spiders in my home. I grab them and they put them outside. <laughs> I, you know, I, I had a feeling this Literally was going to be the answer to fly. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know. Like, I, I can't even think about going hunting. <laughs> like, to me, it's, like, it's like I tried twice to be vegan and vegetarian, but for some reason, my 
uh, my iron and my vi vitamin D like drops to a point where I, I, I don't feel good. And even if I take supplements, it just doesn't work for some reason. And to me, it sucks. Cause I would really rather not eat any animals. So I have to really it's like, don't think about it. Don't think about it. Otherwise you, you will get sick or you will fall on the floor. <laughs> but yeah, if I could, I would be totally vegan. I think. So you heard it here first. <laughs> Absolutely on the hot seat. She will break a light tube over a giant cube of tofu. She <laughs> would front row seats available. There you go. <laughs> well, well, Lefisto, this is the part in the episode where one Mr. Brian Cage has officially given us permission to call. Get your shit in. Uh, so let people know where they can uh, find your social media, buy your merchandise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The floor is yours. The best way to reach me or to get anything, merchandise, or get on my social media is to go on my official website, lufisto.com. From there, you'll get access to my Twitter, which is at Lufisto, my Instagram, Wounded Al Lufisto. I have uh, my channel on YouTube. I try to post, like, different matches. And uh, I have my Patreon, which has more matches, pictures, stories. Uh, no nudes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and more, it's wrestling oriented or cats or coffee or stuff like that, but it's fun. <laughs> and um, yeah, but if you can't remember all of that, lufisto.com and all the links are there. Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, that has been episode 300, 300 of the IndieCast. And uh, like we said, there's no better way that we could have done 300 than with the person that's basically responsible for starting the show, uh, Lisa herself. For, for better or for worse, for better it's on worse. her shoulders. <laughs> that's right. She has to live with that now. Send, no send any hate mail to her. Uh, <laughs> care of the Indiana. That's right. So, um, but Lefisto, thank you once again for joining us and for all of our dozens and dozens. Thank you for joining us once again on the IndieCast. As always, I am Chad Allen. I am Zach Romero. And until next time, everybody, we always say, Deuces. Deuces. <laughs>